Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. This morning we're happy to have with us Karen Bierbauer. Karen has been with us many times before. She's a licensed registered dietitian and a certified eating disorder dietitian. She has a Master's of Science degree in Medical Science and a Nutritional Pediatric Fellowship from the Indiana University School of Medicine. She is the President of Nutritional Guidance. She currently is serving on the Board of Directors for the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. And so for recognizing that this is something we see almost every day in our practice, Karen's going to talk to us this morning on ARFID and meal exposure. Please welcome Karen Bierbauer. Uh, yeah, don't clap before you even heard me. That's a mistake, right? <laughs> All right, they said this is going to take a few minutes. Okay. All right. Um, because they're taping this today, I have to stay behind the podium so the slides are seen with the speaker for uh, future viewers. So pardon that I can't kind of go back and forth a little bit, uh, but we'll still try to keep it as conversational as possible. And I would like to entertain questions at the end, so I'll allow a few minutes for that. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I really thank you all for having me here today. It's always a pleasure uh, to, and an opportunity for us to speak to physicians and physicians in training because I always say that no matter what we do as um, allied health professionals to you is, um, you know, it depends on what you say to the, to the patient. They're going to do what their doctor tells them to do. And we rely on that. And so we want to work closely with you and, and hopefully then have the trust um, built throughout the entire team that's taking care of the patient. So today we're going to talk about the many facets of eating challenges in pediatrics. And um, this is going to encompass this ever-changing uh, topic of picky eating and toddler feeding problems, infant feeding problems that eventually can flow into, if not treated and, and reacted upon appropriately, into eating disorders and especially the new ARFID category. So, I've given this presentation um, in ways uh, over several, several years here, and I constantly change and, and update the presentation because the information is just explosive right now in this field in terms of what is going on, the terminology, what came out with the new DSM-5 a couple years ago, but also just the presentation that we have within our clinical practices. So we want to recognize the current familial and environmental risk factors contributing to these issues, as well as the science of appetite, which again is always changing, and the emotional regulatory controls, and also the environmental piece, which is really um, a, a big issue in terms of the changes that we see. Understanding how the diagnosis of ARFID is working in this population, understanding the fundamentals of food exposure and what that really means and how it's done, and where the physician plays their part in that, and then acquiring the specific tools regarding food and family intervention that can be applied to minimize these feeding challenges, because without the family's involvement and their recognition and everybody on the same page, it's not going to work because that, that will just kind of continue to be a conflict. So, you know, we just love these little people. And um, when we work with food, it's, it's such a dynamic relationship. It can be extremely positive and an enjoyable part, enjoyable part of bringing up a child, or it can be a constant battle zone. And that's what we want to try to prevent. Food neophobia and obstacles on the path to healthy eating we're going to talk about. Um, kind of I hate peas versus feeding disorders and eating disorders. So these are kind of the objectives in more normal terms. Um, is this our fit in understanding appetite and then the war zone that often takes place when we try to intervene with the child who doesn't want to eat? Okay, so we're familiar somewhat with the um, kind of 
tamed it down all of, of all the diagnoses that have been over the past several years of the different types of eating and feeding disorders um, So, in regards to pediatrics. So we really have some of the basic feeding disorders in peds down to the food refusal syndrome, functional dysphagia, food avoidance, emotional disorder, selective eating, pervasive refusal syndrome, and restrictive eating. So where these stand alone, when we uh, get a referral, we're going to screen for these, but knowing that these are all kind of interwoven somewhat in the new ARFA definition. Now, not recognized as sensory processing disorder in terms of, you know, generalized pediatric world, although it's definitely out there in terms of what the parents are looking at, what they're Googling, and a lot of work that's, that's going on out there in that area. So when we look at food refusal, that episodic, intermittent, or situational, it'll occur. It's usually handled pretty well, might need some intervention, might not. Functional dysphagia or food avoidance, that fear of swallowing, choking, or vomiting is definitely an aspect of ARFID. And then food avoidance, emotional disorder, where there is some type of mood disturbance along with the weight loss. Selective eating, where there's a very narrow range of food for at least two years, unwillingness to try new foods. So selective eating is very much, again, a part of that picky eating that now is that kind of umbrella term being used in the literature. Restrictive eating, smaller amounts than usual for age and then pervasive refusal when it moves from food into I'm not going to get dressed, I'm not going to go to bed, I'm not going to get in the car, I'm not going to get in the car seat, I'm not going to do this, so that it's not just in terms of the food, but it's behaviors that are going across an entire spectrum. So that all needs screen for. So when we look at picky eating, what is that being defined as right now currently in the literature is a limited amount of food of uh, usually less than 20 foods. So again, this is not something that a lot of pediatricians have a time in their office to say, okay, let's sit down and really talk about the list. I mean, these are things we can do to help you because we keep a list and when we do these inventories and these assessments, we're talking about not only the foods that they won't eat, but the foods that they fear, why do they fear them, and then keep this list so that we can prepare ourselves appropriately for how to do the food exposures. Restricted intake, especially vegetables, I'm willing to try new foods, strong preferences, different meals from the rest of the family, so is somebody short order cooking in the home, may lead to a physician visit if the parents are that, like, out of their mind enough with this, conflict between the parents, um, let's like us not even go there and the grandparents and the neighbors and everybody else who's taking care of the child. No significant effects on growth usually, and that's a big difference as when it's going from a feeding disorder to an eating disorder, if it starts to affect that growth pattern, and then major recovery you know, over a two-year period, they majority do get better. Um, so we've got all these names and we've got all these terms, and they're very difficult to sort through, and they sometimes overlap. And also, sometimes children and families are using terms that they've heard or they read or whatever that may or may not apply to the problem that's really presented with their own child. So that everybody's just kind of, you know, like Googling everything, what can we say? So what we're talking about in terms of that generalized feeding disorder is it's not going to become an eating disorder until it really starts to interfere, interfere with normal growth and development. So when they start really falling off that growth chart for a significant period of time, we're not having any luck moving them off of that. And there seems to be, it, it just seems getting very complicated. And that's when we're probably looking at and really screening, is this just a, a short-term feeding disorder or is this something that needs a team intervention and a little more um, assistance with that? So the good news is we have ARFID. And, and ARFID came about um, in the DSM-5. Is everybody familiar with ARFID? Okay. Avoided Restrictive Feeding Intake Disorder. And basically, ARFID took, we don't have EDNOS anymore. So if you see that, if you're using that, need to stop, because that's like now three years out, can't be using that. Uh, but a lot of EDNOS went, uh, a lot of, went into the ARFID, because 
ARFID is that category where they, they really were presenting with all of this selective, particular food, and yet you have maybe this child who's eating macaroni and cheese, eating chicken nuggets, eating Oreos. So it's not a fear of fatty foods, but they're only maybe eating 20 foods. They are falling off their growth curve. But the biggest issue here is they do not have any body image issues. Now, this isn't present just in children. We're going to emphasize children here because you're all pediatricians. Um, but it's, it's very widespread in the adult population, too, which is highly disturbing in that population. A lot of those people end up on two feedings until we can work through these issues. However, what you want to note, and always remember with the child, and this is what the parents fail to do, too, if you ask a child, why are you doing this? Why are you restricting? Why are you allowing yourself to lose weight? And they look at you and say, I don't know. And, and then you ask them again, well, but why are you doing this? And they say, I don't know. They don't know. They're like seven or four or nine. They have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. You know, so we, this is where we don't know with an eating disorder. We know there's a genetic component. We know there's some, you know, some neuroscience things going on there. We know all these things. We don't have it well defined, but badgering and keep trying to have them come up with a, a, a rationalization or a connection, they may not know. So it can be something they heard. It can be these innate fears. It can be triggers that they've been given in society, but they don't always know. So what we're looking at unique to ARFID is the apparent lack of interest in food. These are not foodies. Some kids get up in the morning and they can't wait to know how much food they can eat today and what there's going to be to eat. Not these children. Avoidance based on sensory characteristics of the food. It may be the color, it may be the taste, it may be the texture, it may be the environment. Some of these children don't want to eat in noisy places. The cafeteria smells funny. Um, you know, those types of things. And then that turns them off and they won't eat the meal. Concern about aversive consequence of eating, uh, such as the fear of choking, vomiting, suffocating, abdominal pain. Occasionally they may say, I don't want to get fat. And, and they'll kind of throw that out there, but they, they're not restricting because of that. Not a result, a lack of availability of food, not explained by another medical or mental disorder, does not occur within the course of anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, and is not associated with abnormal body image or disturbance. So most of them are very pleased to be able to gain the weight to get back on their growth graph when they're given the education and the consequences of that. So we have that restricting the strong preferences and willingness, that, that picky eater, sensory food of it, um, aversion, selective eater, sensitive eater. So you see that cycle. And that's all kind of, so those other feeding disorders kind of circulate through the ARFID. Often begins in children, and it is highly associated with the autism spectrum disorder, not associated with body image disturbance. So we want to kind of dispel a few of the myths. And one of them is if we say now, he'll grow out of it. We can't make that assumption. We have so much disordered eating in the American population right now. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's real. I know, this is guy smiling over there. I always like to look up and see somebody smiling. I mean, the restriction is out of control. And I don't have time to show it today. I'm just going to throw this out there. But if you have two minutes today and nothing to do with your time, which I know that's here, like, uh, really, have you seen what we have to do? But if you just go on and YouTube Jimmy Kimball gluten. And he has done a piece, it was a couple years ago, actually my kids came and said, Mom, you've got to put this in one of your talks. It's not in this talk, but it is in some. If you just Google Jimmy Kimball Live Gluten, and he does an interview of people who are restricting gluten in California as they leave a gym. Well, of course, most of them are restricting gluten, and then they interview them and ask them, what is it, this thing that you will not eat, gluten? And how many people know what it is that they're restricting? It's a riot. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So you can you can kind of Google that, and then you know what we're dealing with in the rest of our days in our practices. So, and then just let him get hungry enough, and he'll eat. Um, we'd like to believe that, uh, but these are not just necessarily stages. These are fears. 
So if you have a strong enough fear, and you have parents who are really not right now doing a lot with discipline or wanting to work outside of being the friend, we've got a lot of issues going on here. So just letting them get hungry enough isn't working. That's not a system. So we have to have a little more coordinated system that all caregivers are involved in to get these things straightened out. Prevalence and incidence does go down with prolonged intervention and earlier intervention. So we don't want to just wait this out. If you think there's a problem, send them over. We'll screen them out. We'll try to work this out and get some intervention going. Children with moderate levels of sensitive eating had greater levels of depression, anxious symptoms, and ADHD symptoms, and these continued into adulthood. So we, we do know there's issues here. Then this is probably my favorite slide. I do keep it in all my talks because it's absolutely essential for us to know. We have to know the path. We have to know what else has been going on. Um, we all strive for a positive self-image, a body image, a body dissatisfaction. We all have a little bit of that. So, you know, it's kind of like we all have bad hair days. Um, got up this morning and, and I remember, I kept thinking, Dr. Farrell told me, now Karen, now when you come next time, just so you know, um, th this one's going to be videotaped. So make sure you kind of, you know, dress for that and do your hair. And I was like, so this morning I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, you know, so that was kind of like on my mind. So I don't know how that came out because it was windy outside and it was dark this morning. So whatever you got, you got. But the, the reality is, is that most of us know and we have some of that and we say, well, I don't look good in that. I do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Again, we kind of let it go. When we're talking about body dissatisfaction, we're talking about thoughts that permeate a, a patient's mind all day long. So the question we ask is how, how much of your day are you not thinking about this? And that may be an hour. That may be none of their waking time. They're thinking about it all the time. So it depends where that's going. Skip meals, chaotic eating, we all have some of that. But how much of that permeates your normalcy? Dieting, compulsive exercise, then chronic dieting, severe dieting, disordered eating, moving into partial and then full-blown syndromes. So this slide is important to know where are we at with the child. But more important, where is the family at on this slide? Because we can know where the child is at, but then you have to go back and say, where is the family at with this thought process? So I was working with a young girl the other day, and she's in serious trouble with a pretty significant eating disorder. And then she, and then her mom was saying, well, do you listen to what she's saying? And she said, I'm not going to listen to anything what you said, mom, because during the hurricane, you were a wreck because that gym was closed and you couldn't exercise. And the mom said, well, 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 and she was just like, didn't know what to say. And it was very obvious by the relationship that, yeah, mom has these very, very significant, you know, uh, ties to her working out and whatever. So where that has to play, that's kind of like the family therapist piece. I'm the dietitian. No, we're not going there. But, uh, yeah, okay, that's nice. Teamwork's great. So you always could say, yeah, I see that. You need to take that there. You know, we just kind of, you know, kind of send it all out. You know, I'm going to do this food thing. So, but you need to know where the family's at because you can't get anywhere unless we have that knowledge. So, eating or feeding disorder, we have obviously all these concerns on um, where they are at in terms of their physical and mental development, that home environment, um, expectations of the family. So what are the expectations of the family within eating? I mean, I right now have young moms coming in with toddlers saying, well, I, you know, I've tried kale, they won't eat it. I'm like, yeah, well, neither will I. Um, no, I should. <laughs> I, I've seen the analysis. Not interested, kind of better. Uh, probably won't get a two-year-old to take it. So there are other ways we can get iron in a child besides kale. So there, you know, it's, there's certain friendly foods and then there aren't. I mean, I don't know, this taste palette we know doesn't really, change is about 10 or 11. I mean, how many children eat mushrooms? How many adults eat them? Somewhere along the line, they got to be okay. So, but that's not down there. So, I mean, you know, we, we've got to work through those things, too. So how common is this? 25 to 40% of normally developing children and up to 80% 80, 80 uh, delayed children report with some type of feeding disturbance. So, yeah, Houston, you know, we've got a problem here.
Okay, so from bad to worse, um, growth retardation, malnutrition, developmental, psychological defects, social difficulties, and obviously invasive medical procedures we want to stay away from. Current trends, helpful or harmful? Oh, I don't know, I can't even go there. Like I said, watch the video. Um, but um, these are things that we are dealing with across the board. We've got people within the family all following different restrictions and reading different things and talking to different people at work and then bringing that back into the home. Kids are picking up tidbits and getting a lot of mixed messages on food. This is playing into this. And so we've kind of, we've, we've got to get that worked out. Um, this is my plug to pediatricians. We as dietitians need your help to get, when you all meet, like in your own little powwow with LS, to get a consensus here on what you want us to do with this because we don't know. <laughs> we don't know really what you want us to promote and put these kids on because they are on all these things. And we're having a really hard time uh, you know, it was easy when the world drank milk, let me tell you. As a dietitian, we had that. <laughs> we, we knew what to do with that. Now we're really lost here because when we look at the analysis of these things, they are not the same thing. So if you move down, not only across the top at calories, and you can see cocoa milk, coconut milk does not make the grade for a growing child in most cases, but you go down to the protein, um, you can see when almond milk is one. So if they're drinking a lot of almond milk, I'm having a hard time on that toddler and they're spitting out all their dry broiled meat. And, and, the, and you want them to eat something else besides chicken nuggets and I have a protein deficiency sitting there, I'm, I'm losing it here. So we have to really look at the reality that these things aren't matched even though they have milk in the title. This is not milk in, in, in my mind. So I had one mom come in recently. She said, well, my pediatrician said, no more almond milk. We have to go back to milk. And I said, well, how's that going? She said, well, the only way now my kids will drink it is if I put sugar in all the milk because they were so used to almond milk because it was sweet. So she added sugar to all the skim milk and it was going well. I, I said I had to think on that. I'd talk to her next time. So I'm still working on it. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I just love a challenge, right? Okay, so then we have we have the pouches. I have to address pouches because I didn't know a lot about pouches. My children are older, um, but now I know more about pouches than I ever wanted to know about pouches. They scare me, um, but a little bit. There's actually a lot of research done on pouches. There is actually an article on the downsides of baby food pouches and how to use them right. Kind of scary. Um, but anyway, misleading labels, failure to extend the palate, taste, texture, temperature, limited opportunity to extend feeding skills, less socialized eating. I mean, how many come to a table with a pouch? They don't know how to use forks and knives. They don't even know what they are. Um, you know, they're walking around with these things, um, you know, constantly feeling full, so they never come to the, obviously, the table hungry. But everybody loves them because they don't get this stuff in your car. Children eating lumpy food after age of nine months ate less of the food groups at seven years with increased feeding problems because all they're eating is this kind of little bit of food with lumps. Well, I recently had a patient, and, and this is, I'm going to throw in a real short case study here because this just happened within the last month, and a pediatrician sent this child to me and said, I, I don't care, and I don't have a lot of time with this one, but it, the child won't drink any water, won't drink any thin liquids, any water. And it's, she's not dehydrated, but she's falling off the growth curve. She's not eating at the table, don't know why, yada, yada, yada. Turns out that the, bre the child was breastfed until 14 months old and never took a bottle. And it started to, it wasn't doing a much with solids. But when I interviewed the mom, I said, well, what happened? She said, well, they wanted me to continue to breastfeed. And, and she wasn't gaining a lot real well, and she didn't, she never took the bottle, never would take the cup. So mom just gave her pouches. So she got used to this kind of lumpy stuff. So she never ever would take a thin liquid wouldn't take anything except the breast milk. So once a cup was offered, no. 
There are no thin liquids, no juice, no water, no regular milk, nothing that was thin because it was all this lumpy thing. And she was in my office, she was two years old, and she was in my office saying, peck, peck, peck. I was like, peck, what does she want? She said, oh, that's the pop. She calls it a peck. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, so when does she eat these? Well, all day long. Well, does she eat at the table? Well, no, well, she comes, but she doesn't stay there long. Well, no, she's full. I mean, these things have substance, right? So I said, okay, well, what we're good. And she was doing teething biscuits, bars, and small amount of table food and pouches. So where was this two-year-old's child? Her feeding skills, her socialized eating were like non-existent. So what we did, I said, okay, well, what we're going to do is cut off the tops of the pouches when she can see them. Okay, this is still a pouch. We're going to pour the pouch stuff. That's ridiculous. What were we doing to the environment with these pouches? That's another whole talk. Okay, so we're going to cut these off. We're going to throw this in the cup. And then she's going to see that's the stuff. And then we're going to start diluting this out. Let's just keep diluting, diluting, diluting this out. And then we'll make it put a sticker on it. This is my cup. Yada, yada, yada. Identification, all the stuff. She can have control through that. Not what's in it. Blah, blah, blah. And then start to give her this. Within two weeks. We got this down. She was at the table, cup went on the table, pouch is gone. You know, we gave her one pouch at night before bed, like you would bottle weaning. I said, we're going to do this just like bottle weaning because she was never on a bottle. So they never weaned her off a bottle. So it really wasn't, this wasn't an eat a feeding disorder. This wasn't a, an eating disorder. This wasn't picky eating. This wasn't any of this. This was bottle weaning from a pouch. And that's what I sent back to the pediatrician. And <laughs> she was very nice and called me back. And she said, you're a miracle worker. I said, no, I'm not. She just never weaned. So it's, it's sometimes just identifying what is really going on and what stage did we miss. That's what we missed. And, and so we kind of got through that. Probiotics for kids. This I didn't know was out there either until recently and that scared me to death too because if you know what adults are doing with probiotics then looking down at the pedi pediatricians uh, or pediatric world adults believe now that you have to have a bowel movement every single day at the same time because they want that control and so they're using and abusing probiotics to a, a, a very very extended level and we're, we're working with this across the board. And in the adult world, you're not going to be considered to have constipation unless you haven't had a bowel movement in four days. Okay, that's, that's going to be your criteria. Now, they, with these probiotics for kids, we're seeing the parents also want to have control and help them have control as well. So again, we have to be really careful with how these products are being utilized how parents see them, how they're seeing them, and use them for themselves. Again, that spectrum. Appetite is a moving target. You know, kids don't always know when they're hungry. They'll say they're thirsty, and they can't d differentiate between hunger and thirst. So they maybe get a glass of water, you'll be fine. They get a glass of water, yeah, I'm fine. So they're not always hungry when they say they are. There's over 160 clinical and behavioral drives that control hunger and satiety. So ah, mindful eating um, is, is important. Um, I'm not so sure that intuitive eating always works. I think we have moments when all the stars line up and intuitive eating works. And then I think we just have to know a, a schedule and a routine when it's important that we take in the calories that we need, especially if you have active kids, if you have kids that aren't interested in food, and if you have kids who are athletic because usually their caloric demands are much higher than their actual need or desire or their, their actual desire or want for the food and their appetites don't match what their needs are for their athletic development, especially if they're playing soccer at three. I mean, it's like crazy. They're out there doing all this stuff. But anyway, um, so we're looking at all aspects of these children, what they eat, um, the amount of physical activity they have, and, and how they perceive themselves. Are they comfortable with their own image and their, their, um, their skin? So whatever the feeding issue is, the goals are essentially the same. To eat enough to grow, develop normally, and to find a way of addressing the emotional needs through a medium other than food, ensuring the child's context 
is one in which they thrive. So it, with intervention, we got to get the priorities right. We need to restore the rate, the weight, correct nutri nutrient deficiencies, improve their psychosocial functioning if it has been interrupted, and that means no arguing at the table. Um, it, that means being comfortable eating in the cafeteria, being comfortable going to children's birthday parties and being able to eat the food that's served correct mechanical feeding, um, and then add no, new foods, prevent the avoidance of eating, contingent um, access to favored foods, positive reinforcement, and favored with unfavored foods in food exposures. So if we look at food exposures, we want to always be tracking their fear of food, so we need to know what those are, remain calm with food exposures, pairing with comfortable foods, the foods that are uncomfortable, Exposures can be often held outside the meal times. Um, it's okay to do an, a food exposure at 10 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon rather than at 6.30 at the family dinner when, when tensions are really high. So sometimes we have to look at where is the family at, what's going on, how can we put in this meal exposure at a time when it's comfortable for everyone? And is, is, is there a pattern and a structure to that exposure? Awareness, taste, texture, aroma, color, making sure that we understand those are exposures. So a child's trip to a farmer's market, um, uh, you know, just helping prepare food. Not that they necessarily eat it all the time, but that exposure is there. So many of these kids are not eating what their parents are eating. They're not sitting at the table when the parents are eating. They're not even exposed to those foods. They do not know that chicken on a grill or rotisserie chicken is the same meat as a nugget. All they'll eat is chicken nuggets. They think that's something different than what's served on a grill, off a grill. So if they help dad grill chicken and they got involved with the process, when they're engaged with making the food, they're more apt to eat it. So again, it's, it's kind of small interventions, but the family has to be on board. The other thing, facial and language response, both parent and child. So that a big part of what the work that we do is that they, you know, they make those faces. Parents now make these awful faces about food. It's like, stop that. Don't do that. You know, because if you make this food, this face about food, your kids pick that up, right? So if you're looking at your husband saying, we're not going to eat meat around here anymore. I think we should be vegan. The kids are like, oh, what's going to happen? The meal looks up face. So she looks up that. You know, they're going to respond to that. They don't even know what you're saying, but they're, they're getting that tension, right? So you got to be careful about how you're presenting and how you're responding to this, how you, re how you respond to the aromas of foods, to the presence of foods, to what's going on. And right now, most of our reaction to food in our society is negative. It is negative. It is not positive. We are not happy eaters. We are critical eaters. And we are scared eaters. And so it, the kids are picking up on this. So that when we do food exposures, they're not allowed to make faces, and they're not allowed to say, I don't like. How can you not like something you've never had? That's not even possible. So they have to repeat like a dozen times in my office. I don't know if I don't like it. I've never had it before. And they get really irritated that they have to say that. But they, they can't come to a table and start with this, I don't like, I can't eat, I'm going to die, I'm going to choke, I'm going to throw up. You know, because as soon as they do that, what happens? They're like this, and that gag reflex is like right there. But if they sit down and say, you know, tell me something nice, tell me something good that's happened, tell me a joke, or something that they think is funny. I might not think it's funny, they think it's funny. And then if they relax, and I'll say, well, what do you think? If they wanna say I don't like it. Well, I don't know if I don't like it because I never had it before. What happens? They're relaxed. So you don't have that that reflex, that automatic, like here. So they got it. They got to calm down. If the family's not there, they're not going to be there. So if the family says, "You've got to eat that. You have to have this so many times," and well, I don't like that. Why do they have to eat that? Then everybody's like this. That's not going to work. So we've got it. That that facial and language response is huge. Small and consistent change. Small shifts make big change. 
Include the child in the process. They need to know what's going on. They need to know what you're doing. This isn't the thing we hide things and try to sneak things in. Uh-uh, no, they're too smart for that. <laughs> Can't do that. Um, pre and post check-in at meals. Like when I do a check-in, um, I do, um, I was sharing with some of the staff uh, ahead of time, we're doing a lot of these, well, we do them in our office, but uh, we do telehealth. And I love to do these meals um, on the computer with the child at the table. Um, they are, it's just so much more interactive because we can see what they're eating, they can show me their bites, we can, and I can pace them. And I check their anxiety through the meal. Where are you when we start? I'm a five, I'm so, you know, and then like, where are you now? Okay, that wasn't so bad, I'm a two. And then at the end, yeah, I did it. I'm like, I'm good, I'm a zero, I did it, you know. So we can kind of like work through that process and help them out, plus time them and, um, you know, get that through in a period of time. They're, we don't sit at the table for like an hour and a half, like, no, uh-uh, we'll talk about that. Appropriate serving sizes and consistency in how those exposures are carried out. So we want uh, from ages 12 to 30 months, there is less interest in food. Someone has to be gatekeeper in the phone, home. Somebody has to take charge of the food. And it can't be the 14-year-old the who has an eating disorder who's doing all the shopping, all the calculating, and taking care of dad's cholesterol. No, it's better if it's an adult. So um, we really want to make sure that someone's in charge of the food, planning the meals, and caregivers have to work together. You are responsible for what your child is offered. You cannot make them eat. So just, this isn't mommy dearest. So we, and they know that, you know, we tell them, we can't make you eat, but these are the consequences of not eating. And yet we're going to provide this environment where you're going to have all the foods that you need to eat. So that what is the natural consequence of not eating enough food if they're falling off the, off the growth graph? I'm asking. If you don't take in enough food and you don't have enough energy, What's the natural consequence to that? For most parents, it's not watching TV. But what would it be? You can't engage in physical activity, right? I mean, if we have somebody who is older with anorexia nervosa who's falling off their growth graph and they're not taking in enough calories, then we have to pull them out of their activities, right? Because what, what was one of our main goals? We've, we've got to maintain weight. We've, we've got to do weight and nutrient restoration. So if they're not eating lunch, and soccer practice is at two, well, that can't happen. You can't go to soccer on empty. I'm sure that any of the professional soccer players who are out there that we're paying good money to see have eaten lunch. We're banking on that, okay? so. I tell the kids that as well. We're not going to pay money to see athletes play and they're not eating and then they pass out on the field. I want my ticket back. So we can't let them do that. that would, so the natural consequence is pull back the activity. They can do quiet play, they can play Legos, they can read a book, but they can't go to swim practice. Well then this starts making sense to them. This isn't punishment. This is. This is the connection of food. If you don't eat and you're not growing, you don't have the energy it takes to spend on this. So then we're not having an argument. We're not having a control issue with the parents. We're giving them education and this is now making a connection. This makes sense. There is a rationale behind what we're doing with this food. We can sell this. Okay, so this is making sense. So that's why they, they may not like it, the, you know, the whole setup, but they understand it. The natural rhythm of their hunger, understanding food jags, that they may want the same food for a period of time and then stop, and avoid assumptions of what a child will eat. Sometimes they'll eat very odd foods. They might be fine with artichokes, and you're like, I've never eaten an artichoke in my life, but they like them. Okay, fine. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you like them. If they like them, that's great. Fluid control so they don't overdo on the fluid before they start eating and at least 35 trials of the food before we can say a child doesn't like it. 35 trials. Parents try it twice and give up. I'm talking exposures. It might be taste, it might be taking it, spitting it out, putting it back on, playing with it, trying it, I'm not sure. But as long as they're working through it, those are trials. 
They may be best outside the meal and exposure is priceless. Okay, food soft, moist, room temperature. Uh, actually, blue is one of the favorite colors of children's food, according to the data. Not a lot of blue foods out there, but they're blue. Uh, dip sauces, they like to dip, and it might be totally inappropriate what they're dipping. Dipping this and that doesn't make any sense to you. It looks rather disgusting, but don't make the face. Say, that's just great. And then turn around and make your face. That's fine. But soft, moist, room temperature, think of those foods. Does anything come out of a McDonald's bag that is not soft, moist, and room temp? That's why they like it. It's small, it's easy to eat, it's moist, it's not like dry meat and a baked potato and steamed vegetable. It's all done for them. McDonald's knows this. You know, they, they got that and they're making billions and we're fighting over our mashed potatoes and meatloaf. And yet that's soft and moist, so we can sell those things. We just have to work through it. It doesn't look the same. Offer control in non-food related decisions. Let them decide placemats. Do you want to use the Aladdin bowl or do you want to use the Cinderella cup or do you want to, where do you want mom and dad to sit? Let them have control because they want control, they want attention, but not about the food. You never, never, ever, ever ask a child what they want to eat. What are they going to tell you? Pork chops and green beans? No. They're going to come up with something that you had no intention of giving them and then you have an argument. You never, ever ask a child what they want to eat. Somebody just makes the decision. I raised my children, I always made this decision. They had three choices to eat in the house. Take it, leave it, or go to the neighbors. That was it. I worked, that was, uh, it was the only choices they had. And one night they were standing at the back door deciding if they should go to Miss Mary Ann's down the street because she was Italian, she always served spaghetti. I was like, go, she likes you kids, I'll call, she'll feed you. And then they decided to stay. But they, they really were like, maybe we should, we really don't like this thing. It was like, okay, I don't care, whatever. But those are, those are you gotta set those rules and boundaries. Involve them with prep, books, games, whatever. Okay, dietary supplements. We use them, but you got to be careful. Most of them are sweet. And so once they get onto the sweet, they think every meal then has that sweetness in that. And, and that can be a problem. But we can use substances like beta-calorie, I, I, you know, names, I'm not promoting one name or another, but it, it, it's just a substance that's a fat emulsion, has protein in it, it's not sweet. Anything we can do, dry milk powders, things like that, that we can add to food that is not sweet. If you're going to use a supplement, it's best for you to use it outside of the meal so that they don't get dependent on that sweetness of the, of the um, food itself. So when it does not work and you end up in this food battle, and so you're doing the exposures, you're trying to do it right, and this child is just, just driving you crazy and throwing the food still and everybody's at battle and, and it's not working. Initially, you're going to go through this because you're disrupting their routine that they've built and that has been working for them very, very well. And so and this can happen with ARFID, depending on the age of the child. But what you want to do is just relax, re-look re re at that conversation you're having about the food and that it's about the socialization and the appropriate behavior. It's not about the peas that are eaten or the number of peas that are eaten. And we do not reward for the amount of food eaten. We take it off of that. Food itself is a gift. Again, what is the reward if they eat the food? Their growth and their physical activity. They get, their bodies are gonna be healthy and they can do what they need to do. That is its own reward. If you go to school and you get good grades, you're going to get in the college, hopefully, of your choice. That is its own reward. You don't need to pay for grades. Okay, so there's a natural reward there for the food. We don't need to promise to take them to Disney if they eat two peas. Because then the parents are doing this and I'm like, well, what are you going to do when they eat a full half a cup? You're going to Europe? I mean, it's like these, I mean, it's going like, where are you going to go with this? If they're, do, if they're getting all these rewards on, on these minute amounts that aren't even appropriate serving sites for them. So then we, we have no grounding. No grounding for which they're making those decisions to eat. So we have to have a healthy conversation about that. And then we have to hold that applause. 
then we also have to engage the parents. And what we need to do, if a child is misbehaving, what you do is you remove them with the food from the family. They do not like to be disengaged from the family socially. They're social beings. They want attention. They just don't care if the attention is negative or positive. We like positive attention. So we, when we go into our supervisor's office, if this isn't going well, we want out. A two-year-old doesn't care. They'll stay in there if it's positive or negative, just as long as it's all about them. So it's a totally different mindset. So they'll stay at the table and disrupt everybody as long as everybody's focused on them. And so we teach the child, what is everybody at the, the table doing? Well, eating. Okay, does mom need to eat? Yes. Does dad need to eat? Yes. So when they'll come back in my office and the parents are like, this didn't go well, they were interruptive again, blah, 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 I'll look back at the child. Did mom come to the table? What happened? Well, uh, yeah. Did she get to eat? No. That's the problem. Mom needs to eat. Taking it off of that. This wasn't about you didn't eat your peas. Mom didn't get to eat. Dad got up from the table. Brother was upset. This isn't right because they need to eat. Everybody needs to eat. So how are we going to get everybody back at the table so everybody can eat? Because they have to go to work. They have to do this. Mom had to do this, and now nobody got to eat. We have a problem. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that, that didn't work. No, that's not working. So we, when we move the child, instead of saying, it leaves the table, we can't take it anymore. We move the child with their food, put them at a little toddler, you know, those little picnic tables or whatever in the kitchen or on the porch where you can see them so they won't, like, choke and die, but they can't interact. All right, so you remove them with their food because it's not a choice not to eat. It's the choices they made that can't be with the family. They are not socially acceptable. I'm sorry. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So you just get them away from the family. Family eats. You go back, and if it's not eaten, okay, dinner's done. Oh, well, now I'll eat. You're here. So now I'll carry this out, and I'll eat. No, dinner's done. This is done, and you'll get food again at snack. You decide when snack is and you decide what it is instead of what it might have been in your mind if it's going to be a half a sandwich and a glass of milk because you think well that might replace some of what they didn't eat at dinner then you decide and that's snack and again it's controlled so the food comes from the parents the situation so it's not you have to sit there until it's, it's done and it's 8 30 and they're still looking at the cold corn no we're not doing any of that this is going to be controlled until they, they decide to be a little bit more part of the system. The parents need to not blame themselves. The kids are doing this. This is natural. If it gets too far with ARFID, then the meal exposures are very con clinically controlled. We are instructing the parents on how to deal with this eating disorder, what to do with it, how to deal with the fears, the vomiting, the gagging, the intensity that they come to the table with the fear of food, um, how to work through all that. So if an ARFID diagnosis is made, we are directing that clinically, very specifically, on those food exposures and interactions. So we're talking kind of a little bit two different things here, generalized picky eating, and then we're talking about ARFID being a little more controlled in those food exposures. When we have an ARFID patient at a higher level of care in eating disorder treatment, they do not get the body image support groups and that type of work. They're taken out separately and done more with just the food exposure because they do not have the body image dis distortion. So parents um, need to be part of this system. Um, clinicians should avoid taking over the parental responsibility, but rather trying to empower the parents if it's appropriate. Now, if it's not appropriate and the parents are continuing to be split and one is not supporting the other, that needs directed possibly through family therapy if the, if the problem is significant. And then support regarding patients and time. This is what I cannot emphasize enough, and this is where we lose. And the data shows significant loss in treatment of ARFID and in picky eating. And the problem is, is because it takes so long. These parents come in, and if two weeks, if it's not resolved, then they're like, this isn't working. This is a long process. To get children out of this, we're talking well, eating disorder treatment in and of itself is two to six years. 
So picky eating can take, depending on how long it's gone on, but it's going to take several months to a couple years, depending on how severe, to get a child back to normal eating on their growth graph and everybody thriving with the same consensus and in kind of um, disciplines across the board and belief systems regarding <laughs> food. Now that doesn't mean that the parents eat exactly what the child eats all the time. There's always individual preferences, but in general, there has to be some kind of acceptance of the food philosophy within the home for this to go well, and we have to move back to that somehow. It's not all about the food. These kids are getting a lot of messages. Over 50% of food ads are targeted to children, so we have to be very aware of where they're getting these messages, and also just in apps. I mean, they're app and everything. They're on their little video things. Our waiting room, is, and I'm sure as yours, are, they're very quiet now because everybody's on their screens. It's really disturbing, isn't that? I, it's, nobody's talking. Anyway, uh, I'll just close with this reminder. The attitudes of the parent, which represent the attitudes of the times that they live in, and that's very important, are evident from the way they feed their child. And even in these enlightened times, our feeding attitudes and practices are often inconsistent with what we have or should have learned. It is definitely time to move back to the basics. And, and I really believe this, and so um, I think that we need to keep that in mind and always know that what we're dealing with with these kids when they come in our office is dependent on very much environmentally the messages that we're getting in our society. So with that, um, uh, that's my information up there, but can I entertain any questions for you regarding this topic? Yes. Okay, excellent talk again, as usual. Oh, thank you. I thought, I thought you've heard this before. <laughs> well, my question is, are there any indications early on in that parent-child interaction? I'll give you an example that I think uh, that there's going to be a problem. You know, used to and that's what I ask you about is when you know, you're going through that, in that first year of life, you're going through the food introduction speech, you know, spiel, and then they go, well, I let the child inside, that child led. And is that like a red flag? How, how, how can a child no, make a amazing. food decision? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think okay. this is like, it's kind of like, well, oh, I'll, I think my, my teenager can decide curfews and what is the best fit for them. It's like, really? I mean, they, they don't get frontal lobe what development in males until 26 there? years of age. Oh. Yeah, no. I mean, it's like, and actually, my son's 33, and he said, Mom, I think my frontal lobe's finally done. I was like, well, your wife is pregnant, so that's probably a good thing that you're stopping playing with Legos and you got it together, because um, now you can get started again. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's like you, we've got to say there's certain things that has to be controlled in the home with a knowledge base. This isn't something that's frivolous. When we're talking about food decisions, we are talking about their growth, their maturation, and their nutritional development. And we show the kids their graph. I mean, I showed them, I said, this looks complicated that your pediatrician sent over. This is, n this is not. We're gonna line up 100 kids your age in the class, okay? And then this one's the tallest, this one's the shortest. You were 55. You're now number three. And I said, that, now, is that about right? Are most of the kids taller than you? And you're like way down there? And they're like, yeah. Well, that wasn't how it was. You were in the middle. We are not now. And then they just look at you, but that's not a problem. Don't get scared because we're going to get you back. And this is how we're going to get you back. So if you explain that, then they look at their growth graph and they're like, okay, where am I? Where am I in my growth graph? And then we have a goal sheet. I have each one of them in my computer, and it's a color goal sheet. These are your goals, and this is what I've achieved, and there's a big blue ribbon on it, and their picture, and their name. So they come in to my office, and we go over their records and what they're doing, and then they come over to my computer and go, okay, let's look, look at your goals. This is what you were supposed to do. I was supposed to say this before I sat down. I don't know if I like it because I never tried it. I was supposed to sit at the table and not disrupt the family, and then I was supposed to try these foods. And I'll say, did you do this? 
No. Okay, that stays over here. Did you do this? I did that. Okay, let's move it. And then we move it over in this other column, and they get a sheet to take home and they put on their fridge. They take ownership. It's not mom's telling me to do this, or dad's telling me to do this, or you're telling me to do this. We have a system, but it's not based on reward. The reward is you move this behavior to acceptable because you want to be an acceptable human being, right? You want to get invited to birthday parties, right? You want other kids to not be gagging when they watch you eat lunch. Yeah, that's what I want. Okay, well, that's it. And the parents are like, you know, they say, well, when they gag or throw it up at the table, what am I supposed to do? I said, tell them, that's disgusting. You can't do that. That's bad manners. And they're like, but it's my child. I said, okay, you can tell them, or the kids at school are all going to get up from the table and run and say nobody can eat with him because it's disgusting. So what it hurts the parent more? Have that happen to your child? They're the only ones sitting on the curb in the playground? Or you take care of it at home? And so we either have parenting or we're trying to be everything pleasant all the time. That's not parenting. So we've got to try to help them see what are manners, what is social acceptable behavior. And they'll start in my office and they'll start and they take the little teen, I mean, we're talking a cracker crumb, you know, sesame seed side. And they put it in and they start gagging. It's like, oh, really? You know, we know. And it's like, what are you doing? Stop that. Don't spit up on my desk. And then they, okay, and they swallow because what did they do? They just stopped it. They got so surprised, the gag reflex up, they sat back, and, and I said, oh, did you swallow it? Uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, you ate. What, like, what just happened? You have to break the cycle somehow, because they, they, it's just like an automatic. So when you say, you, you can't, that's, that's unacceptable. We gotta reverse this. We gotta, you know, do a lot of techniques and work. You may need an OT on some of this. Sometimes we go through that, get that screening. But if everything's okay and it's not that kind of texture, they're not pocketing, they're not all those things. Once we get through all that, we can get through interest behavior and get them calmed down. We can make some progress. But the parents, no, leaving the choice of what to eat to a child. Uh, that's like giving them a credit card at the mall when they're ten. But whatever. <laughs> I think it's dangerous. <laughs> yes. What is advice we can give younger parents, you know, like kind of starting out to try and prevent getting to this? Oh, I, I think I think the easiest thing is family meals, wide variety of foods, and just again those. Uh, I, I I don't all these products. You know, just as much as you can go back to table foods, eating off plates with utensils, and avoid feeding them all day long. They don't come to the table hungry. If you had a bag of Cheerios in your hand all day, how hungry would you be for lunch? So they don't have a regulatory hunger fullness system if they're eating and drinking out of pouches and sacks or packs or whatever all day. So you have to kind of regulate their hunger, get them ready for the meal, and then as much meal orientation as we can, I think absolutely is a key. And you're always going to have some foodies and some not. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, this doesn't even start the, the rest of the obesity. Well, it actually can if you you can have children who are uh, at the higher spectrum of weight and still eating a very limited selection of foods, but they're eating a lot of it, and the parents aren't working outside of that, always getting them their McDonald's, their their certain foods, and and keeping them at a higher body weight with a limited variety of foods. So you can't rule a picky eater out. Uh, by definition, yes, they're at lower body weight, but you can have a child who's at the higher weight spect spectrum who does not have a wide variety of socialized eating. So you can't necessarily, you know, there's always, you know, that bell-shaped curve. Oh, that's a comment you made, that's an excellent point. How often do you think about, how often is there, are you not thinking about your what food or your Oh, the hours in a day. Well, that's a classic question that we ask a child with an, uh, or any person with an eating disorder. How many hours of the day are you not focused on your weight, 
uh, your body image or food related thoughts and th that's that's a telltale and it is for parents when they hear well I think about this all day long they cannot because that's that obsessive focus of that illness exactly anything else you've been delightful thank you very much for